Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cosmic Echo, a Tale Leader podcast. I'm your host tonight, Lee Adams, and I'm speaking with Stephen Gray, who is the author of Cannabis and Spirituality. In this episode, we speak with Stephen about cannabis, as well as the uses of cannabis in a more spiritual practice, as well as Zen Buddhist practice and um, other practices that can be used in conjunction with cannabis, as well as uh, some other plant medicines as well. And Stephen also talks about his uh, conference that's coming up in, um, in November. So let's just get to it. Well, thanks for um, joining me on the show today. And I just want to... Um, have you introduce yourself and talk about um, what got you interested in cannabis and um, what brought you into writing uh, the book Cannabis and Spirituality? Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know. I never know how short or how long an answer to give to that one because yeah. it actually, you know, uh, I have <clears throat> confessed my age group. I'm you know, one of these uh, baby boom generation people, you know. And so for me, it goes back to uh, my late teens, which would be in the late 1960s. And uh, there was a confluence of some very interesting explosive kind of energies at the time uh, that came on quite rapidly into into the cultures that you know, that I was, uh, t you know, tuned into, um, uh, uh, which was the two the two main things were uh, a, a more almost sudden interest in spirituality, in particular, Asian spirituality, Hinduism, Buddhism, Zen, uh, that sort of thing uh, that came about. And this was com completely intertwined with uh, uh, a, a parallel interest in psychedelics. Um, and so uh, some people were only interested in the more sensational side of the psychedelics, you know, you know, party, whatever, you know. Um, and uh, and but other people, and I was one of those, uh, were very interested in the spiritual uh, use of these substances. Didn't know boo about them really in in that context at the time. So that was kind of what got me going. And of course, cannabis was part of that, uh, you know, explosion of interest as well. And so the the people who identified themselves as what they now call hippies, but at the time that was a pejorative. Um, uh, at the time, uh, it was like black people. Uh, you know, using the N word to self describe and kind of turning it into a plus instead of a minus, right? Um, and so we called ourselves freaks, mm. uh, you know, uh, which was like saying, well, yeah, we're freaks to your culture, but your culture sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, and, but an, another more uh, general term was counterculture. So I was, I identified as part of that, was very interested in all that and got, you know, into those things at the time. I, uh, I'll try to keep this short, actually. Oh. Um, you know, one thing led to another. Um, well, I should maybe say this as a little bit of background. There was a meme around at the time, which was uh, for people who had taken psychedelics, LSD was kind of the main one at the time for most people. Was uh, okay, so maybe you've had some amazing experience, touched with touched the the feet of God or whatever. But now, what are you going to do? You know, you can't just do LSD every day and hope to you know stay in a divine state or whatever. Um, so for a lot of people, it was the answer to that uh, question was uh, some sort of ongoing engagement with spiritual practice. And for me, that became Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism. So I was involved with that for quite a long time. Um, into the well into the 90s from mid 70s more or less and uh, um, and there was no you know that community wasn't using psychedelics at all so I kind of left it behind but then found out the, about the work of Terence McKenna in the late 80s and that kind of reconnected those two you know the spiritual use of these things ancient history with indigenous people and so on um, so I kind of I got back into it back in the 90s and uh, one thing led to another and another and another I did a book in 2010 called Returning to Sacred World. Um, that connected me with the people running this uh, conference that uh, I have been co-organizing for the last seven years. And that led to the book Cannabis and Spirituality um, and collecting people to write for it. Ended up with 17 contributors plus my own chapters. So, and yeah, I've been, uh, you know, as I mentioned to you earlier, I spent a lot of time going to Native American church peyote ceremonies for about a dozen years. I've done ayahuasca probably 30 or 40 times in total now, 
com in combination between the Santo Daime Church way and the Amazonian lie down in the dark uh, in a yurt way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that and other experiments that I already mentioned to you, you can ask anything you want. Yeah. yeah it sounds like you have a broad scope of um, experiences with plants. And I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in why specifically cannabis, cannabis is like kind of your go-to sacrament, um, at least in the, in this, you know, focus on this book and your work. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, it's not even so much uh, that I consider cannabis like the best you know, um, spiritual plant or ally, you know, these other plants are in a sense, some of them other as others are sharper and deeper for the most part, you know, uh, as sort of like the midpoint, so to speak, you yeah. know, um, cannabis is quite gentle in comparison in that regard. Uh, no, it, it was actually because I started to feel uh, in the course of my reading studies and contact with people and so on that cannabis was getting the short, getting short shrift as a spiritual ally um, uh, you know many people using it recreationally of course and in a developing interest uh, and research in its medicinal benefits but very few people seem to understand that it actually has a, a truly ancient and, and surprisingly widespread uh, um, uh, historical use as a spiritual medicine I, I recently uh, read a short book called uh, getting high subtitle uh, marijuana through the ages and mm. uh, his, his this fellow's um, uh, central contention is that uh, over the course of uh, human history cannabis has been used far far less as a recreational substance than as a spiritual medicine and so uh, I, there was a specific conversation Kathleen Harrison the former wife of Terence McKenna um, and I spent the day together after our conference up here in Vancouver in 2012. And I told her I'd been, you know, thinking this about cannabis, that it needed more attention. And she said, well, you know, if you put a book together on that, I'd contribute to it. And, uh, and I love her. She's amazing. She's brilliant. She's um, a wonderful writer also. Never written a book, but I've seen essays she's written for other people's books. And that was like, okay, Kat, Kat Harrison's going to write you know, contribute to the book, I'll go for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that, that was really the genesis. The reason for the book was cannabis can have, uh, you know, uh, very, can, can very effectively contribute to spiritual awakening, I believe, over time, uh, if used carefully. I consider it a, uh, an advanced spiritual medicine, surprisingly, mm -hmm. considering how gentle most people think it is. But it's actually tricky to learn how to use it that way properly. Yeah, um, in the states, definitely here, um, I've noticed that you know, with the the changes in changing in the law, it's become uh, broadly used by people and kind of uh, abused in many ways. I think they're just um, taking higher and higher doses of the THC and um, trying to get high, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering how um, how you treat cannabis and like the traditional way of t treating cannabis and how people used it to actually communicate with um, spirits and um, heal themselves through the use of the actual plant itself? Mm -hmm. Well, it's been used quite a few different ways. Uh, um, a, a lot of the historical record is uh, taking it orally, actually, like in India in particular, with the, like the bong lassis and all that sort of thing. Although the sadhus, which who claim the, the those are the wandering uh, ascetics of, uh, of India, for people who don't know that, um, they claim to have been around, they actually claim to be the originators of Hinduism, like the sort of original source of it. I don't know if that's historically verifiable or not, but that's what they say. And uh, they've probably been using cannabis, you know, for a couple of thousand years or more. Uh, and I believe they generally tend to smoke it. But um, there's there's record, uh, there's a really interesting article by a guy named Michael Aldrich uh, that was published in a book called Orgies of the Hemp Eaters, which was a tongue-in-cheek title um, by uh, Ab Abel Zug and Hakim Bey, um, who collected a whole bunch of stories. And Michael Aldrich writes about a practice called the Maha Nirvana Tantra, which was, I think, 11th century or 1100s, I think 11th century India. It was a, uh, I think it was a Buddhist, uh, I think it was within the Buddhist tradition. And uh, they would uh, uh, take a, um, a, a yogin and a yogini and put them through a rigorous preparation process for weeks. 
And of course, these people are already very experienced with spiritual practices anyway. And then they would bring them into the temple. The monks would be sort of protecting the whole scenario and uh, have them drink, uh, you know, a lassi or whatever it was. And then they would, um, it would be like a tantric uh, sexual union, but, you know, not for the purpose of having a jolly time, but actually to surrender and completely dissolve into the divine. Hmm. And that, you know, so that there's been that kind of use uh, historically as well. Uh, so there have been quite a few different ways that people have used it, and it's uh, and it's you know it's it's shown up in uh, many parts of Asia, into your in Middle East and Europe, and uh, uh, supposedly from what I've read after or into the common era or the Christian era is when it uh, spread into Africa, and has been used shamanically and meditatively and you know all these things down through many places uh, with indigenous communities in Africa as well and in Americas now but as far as we know not prior to European invasions of, of, of the Americas um, so it's it's uh, um, I don't know I could talk more about uh, you asked you know sort of how I yeah, guess um, yeah I think uh, people would like to learn actually how to properly kind of I mean there's probably no proper way of using cannabis you know you're going to get an effect but um, <laughs> what is the more spiritual way of using it I mean I, I've used it before and um, from my experience it's kind of like uh, I use it for pain management you know so <laughs> it's like a medicine but I have never really I, I could see the benefit of using it as a spiritual type of uh, ally in a way because um, something is definitely in a way trying to communicate to me like uh, mm -hmm. as in ayahuasca or something like that I get mm -hmm. slight feelings of that but I don't get the full yeah. effect and it it may be sure. because I'm not using it in the right setting set setting and things like that mm -hmm. yeah that's why I said earlier I think it's an I consider it an advanced spiritual medicine because it does take I, I feel like you know after you know roughly 50 years of working with this plant I'm still learning I'm still refining my uh you know my practice with it um so uh i think really the most important place to start with in talking about how cannabis can be a benefit in spiritual awakening is to talk about what actually spiritual awakening is and yeah. you know not that i'm going to make any you know grandiose claims of being completely awake or anything you know nonsensical <laughs> like that <laughs> or or egotistical like that um uh but i you know i've i i've practiced meditation a lot studied with for a long time with tibetan buddhism and i think i understand the basic principles and, and to, you know from uh study and practice and uh you know glimpses of uh, the awakened state here and there perhaps um and so this is kind of a buddhist way of talking about it but it's universal really um and so the shortest way i can i can de describe it is that the way Buddhists would talk about it is there is such a thing as unconditional reality. Um, it's not a position, it's not a dogma, it's not a belief, it's not something you figure out in your head. It's what um, my old Buddhist teacher Chugyam Trungpa uh, described as what you land on when you let go of all the other stuff that's in the way of that. So it's like it's, we just get in our own way of a state that's natural to all human beings. The word Buddha just means awake. Um, so the, the the historical Buddha is just described as one who was awake, um, and and the teachings of Buddhism, uh, and I think any genuine spiritual tradition that's understood the nature of reality would have to agree that there is a state that's unconditional, that's not dependent on anything other than allowing yourself to land on what is. Um, um, it. Uh, see, we basically so so another part of that that's probably important to to describe briefly is, uh, again, you know, more or less using Buddhist way of describing ego uh, as um, an illusion, that, that we have an illusion that there's a there's a, a self that exists that is separate from everything, it's not connected to to the, you know to the cosmos to you know to whatever to planet to plant to human whatever that we're that we have this little sort of uh, ego that is created uh, uh, generated by a um, long developed uh, narrative configuration or package of stories that we tell ourselves about what's true not true real not real all those sort of things and that puts us in a box of sorts but there's there's a whole vast world outside of that box so then how do we access that uh, or again land on it is the question right so um 
the way that the the great teachings you know would say is that you have to somehow uh, release, let go of, see through, dissolve, surrender uh, this narrative package uh, to be able to open up to it. And um, and probably the core central understanding of how to do that, you know, short of describing different practices themselves, is that we have to get out of our heads, hmm. you know, because uh, it's the this narrative package lives in thought, uh, the old. Um, yeah, this is the core spiritual teaching that uh, that you know that we we generate uh, this narrative package and maintain it by being busy in our minds all the time, right? With this constant sort of yeah. whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah, and and the way Buddhist teachings talk about that is is it creates a a, a a field of obscuration, you know, like layers of you know you know curtains between us and and this unconditional reality. So again, how do you um, uh, how do you allow yourself to come out of that? You have to have practices in your life that allow you to relax and to open and get out of your head. Like let you know that's why the core I, I'd call it the universal med, uh, practice is uh, is uh, simple. Uh, follow your breath kind of uh, what sometimes called bare attention hmm. meditation or formless meditation. Um, and it's universal because you don't even have to think of yourself as a spiritual person to do that or to, you know, to understand how that essentially works is that um, it's just a matter of being as present as possible, allowing what comes up to come up, letting it go, not hang, not you know, developing it or hanging on to it or whatever, and doing that again and again and again and again. And then gradually one would hope <laughs> sort of settling down and letting go of this little tight package, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so where cannabis comes into that is that uh, one, you know, I think good way to describe cannabis or one of its functions is as a non-specific amplifier. Uh, this is a term applied to other psychedelics as well, and and so what that means there's a there's a biochemical explanation for that, and uh, one of the contributors to the book, Joan Bellow, uh, talks about that, and like. If you want, I can talk about it, but I'll skip that for the moment. Um, basically, uh, it does have this amplification process. Actually, I should say something very briefly about it, um, especially when you smoke it or vaporize it. Uh, taking it orally uh, can take up to two hours to kick in, so it's a very or kick in fully, and so it's a very slow, gradual rise. But you know, as you know, or most people know, when you smoke or vaporize it, the effects are, you know, to all intents and purposes, uh, immediate, right? Yeah. Within a minute or two or whatever. So what happens with that is that it's opening up your system physiologically. It's um, increasing uh, the. Uh, it causes your heart rate to speed up a bit, pumping more fresh, richly oxygenated blood throughout the system. Um, and potentially relaxing the uh, what Joan Bello calls the opposite calls the oppositional uh, or skeletal muscles, hmm. um, uh, and so uh, it's just in a sense amplifying the whole system. This is why people often find their level of visual acuity increased, uh, their uh, appreciation of music. I mean, I literally, uh, I, I've made a lot of music. I've, I've you know recorded albums and things like that, and you know I'll I'll work on a piece. Um, an instrumental piece or something, you know, using multi-tracking on computer and all that. So you, I've got it recorded and I'm working with it for a few days and then I'll have a puff or two and then listen back to it. And I swear I've like physically <laughs> hear things that I never heard yeah. before, right? Not to mention the ideas that come in. You, know, you get this inspiration that comes in as well, right? Um, and that's one of the th themes that's mentioned in the book is cannabis as a creative uh, tool as well. But any, but as a as a kind of more you know uh, direct spiritual awakening ally or or medicine, it's this idea that if you you have this temporarily um, uh, amplified psychically and amplified so to speak uh, it's 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 kind of um, holistic in a sense it's mind body spirit uh, temporary uh, just as with the so-called major antigen antigens so it's temporary entry potential into that space or those spaces and um, so if you can channel that energy uh, which again means at least for part of the time you're working with it 
somehow being able to let go of your thoughts hmm. and empty. It's like the, the more you can empty into this medicine or her, as people like Kathleen Harrison describe her, <laughs> um, the more she can be there and do her work. You know, it's uh, I sometimes think of it as like uh, as if you're working with a therapist you know, or, uh, you know, or, or a guru even because, hmm. you know, a, a proper, a, a genuine guru who's not trying to get into your pants or whatever yeah um, pardon <laughs> pardon the cheesy humor um uh uh who's really awake uh functions as a mirror um and so uh the only way you actually meet uh enlightenment or 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 you know awakening is by uh surrendering to to that clear mind and so you could say that cannabis has that potential as well that there's uh, whether you want to personify it uh, into a, an entity like a, a spirit being, which people do, um, such as Kathleen Harrison and others, um, or at least they talk about that potential, or just simply uh, what it does, you know, in a somewhat less spiritual or woo woo way of talking about it. Um, uh, uh, it, I, I think it's perhaps instructive to think of it as a being in that regard, because if you do surrender to it, surrender to the space that you're in when you when you use it, uh, then it has this potential to open you up. It has this potential to uh, settle you down so that you can land on what is to some degree or another. Um, it can open up your heart that way. It can it can uh, actually uh, uh, evoke uh, a state of uh, peace, like hmm. peace of mind, you know. Uh, it can do all those things, uh, but because those those states of mind are uh, for, you know, almost all human beings very difficult to allow, uh, it's no easier to, in a sense, allow it with cannabis. And in fact, it can be harder in some ways because of, you know, in other words, if you sit down to meditate, you know, how many people can sit for half an hour without a thought? Yeah. Not many. Not many. <laughs> not many. <laughs> I can't. Maybe Eckhart Tolle can, yeah. but I can't. Um, and so uh, because the energy level and the stakes, in a sense, of the potential for ego dissolution are raised with cannabis, in a sense, it's even more challenging. You really have to surrender. You really have to kind of have some courage, in a sense, to let go and trust, uh, you know, the awakened state, you might say, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, for people that are maybe not that experienced with doing that kind of thing, which I gather is a lot of people. Yeah. Um, it's important to say that it, you know, you know, also with uh, any moment of spiritual awakening, whether it's a sudden awakening that occurs through meditation or whether it's with um, ayahuasca or, what, or whatever it is, uh, y your, your life isn't likely to be changed dramatically in one encounter like that. It's not so much about just having an experience. Joan Bellow is really good about that in the book as well, uh, uh, where she talks about how it's a it's a it's a, uh, a long term project. Uh, it's an accumulated accumulated uh, learning. So, excuse me. Again, one way of thinking about cannabis is it allows you to enter into the now more deeply. Mm. You know, you can appreciate being present. You can slow your mind down, ideally, you know, and and let go and uh, have a deeper appreciation of just this moment. So another way of, that might be useful to think about for people uh, about how that works is, um, this is, I think I got this from my Buddhist teacher at one point. He talked about the uh, this trajectory from sort of what you might call the beginning of the spiritual path, the state of, you know, complete uh, identification with egos, you know, uh, illusory or illusionary narrative package to the awakened state, if you take it as a kind of a path quality. Um, over here at the beginning, you're trusting only the stories that you've told yourself, that you've shipped on, et cetera, et cetera, right? And the journey or the path quality trajectory is gradually learning to trust the awakened state mm -hmm. that exists for all of us, so which means trusting um, your intelligence in this moment regardless of your beliefs and concepts about life, right? Just being very, very present. Um, and that's how you learn. This is hmm. what Joan talks about in the book as well, um, that uh, by tapping into that state with some frequency, um, you become more accustomed to it and it becomes part of your life. 
I saw something on the internet today, some quote by some guy saying, you can't unlearn insights. You know, like once you've had an experience, it's you've had it, you know? Yeah. And so even if it kind of recedes into your more or less unconscious, it's still, uh, you know, kind of eating away at you, so to speak. In fact, that's what the same Machugiam Trungpa, how he describes uh, this uh unconditional reality or an awakened state is that it's always an irritant to this uh, ego uh, because uh, it's there and somehow at, even at the most unconscious level we know it and so we're actually actively what we're all doing is kind of going around actually fighting off uh, surrendering uh, mm. to the awakened state you know it's, uh, the ego is, a, is synonymous with struggle mm. actually actively having to kind of keep the mind busy, keep focused, keep avoiding um, what's underneath all that, right? And so cannabis can help you slow down, uh, relax into that, and begin to trust that state. That makes sense, man. Um, and that's a lot Good. different than what, you know, typically I would hear about cannabis use and how to actually use it. I mean, whenever I use it, definitely the thoughts get amplified, and, and that's something, oh, yeah. you know, I, <laughs> I thought how it can just be used as a tool. And then if you think about it, having the amplification kind of becomes an additional um, struggle, you know, like a, it, mm -hmm. it brings it out to the forefront so you can actually see these thoughts and how kind of crazy these stories are and that, you know, you don't mm -hmm. have to get wrapped into them. So that yeah. I've tasted parts of what you're saying, but I've never used it in the way that you really uh, mm -hmm. communicated to. So that's really great. Um, I mean, with, when people are using cannabis to do these types of practices, are they using um, large amounts of it or are they using, I mean, orderly is different than smoking, obviously. So are they using a, you know, like a large portion or are they, I mean, what's your recommendation? What's your philosophy on that? Yeah, no, it's a good question, and it's actually quite important. Uh, dosage is really important uh, in how you do this. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. I just, there was something about what you just said I wanted to comment on, if I may first, if I can remember yeah. it. Um, uh, it uh, uh, no, I think I've lost it. Oh, it was no. something. Yeah, no, no, no worries. Um, um, no, okay, so I'll just answer that one. Um, uh, okay, so there's a few ways... Uh, useful ways to, to approach that or think about it. Um, one of them is less is more. And uh, one way to translate that is that, especially if you're newer to the plant um, or newer to trying to work with it that way, and or if you have a particularly sensitive constitution, uh, a cheap date, so to speak, um, it's recommended to start with a very small amount, you know, especially with a strong you know, high THC stuff that's around these yeah. days, right? Um, it's not about getting blasted, right? You know, what you mentioned at the beginning about, you know, people taking, you know, really, really strong things just to get high. That's actually part of ego, egos in general. I think it's actually part of egos attempt to avoid mm. unconditioned reality, you know, uh, by escaping whatever's going on you know, and getting into this sort of, you know, out of it and into this altered space. Um, one of, uh, this is a slight tangent, but still on the same theme. Uh, one of the things that Kathleen Harrison says so clearly in her chapter in the book is that um, in her experience, and she's very experienced, uh, she's been around it, she's, she's, you know, been around the growing of it, and, you know, uh, she's been using cannabis as a spiritual medicine for probably 50 years or so and been around a lot of people of all kinds uh, and all sort of approaches. And she said what she's observed is that a lot of people, and they tend to be young men in particular, she's noticed, have, have, have tended to use cannabis uh, to avoid uh, what she calls uh, the daylight world of uh, relationship and responsibility. Hmm. They get so they, they think they're entering into this cozy little space and they want to stay there and they don't want to come back out of it. You know, so that's that's not, you know, obviously healthy for a lot of people and it can ruin lives, actually. And it has uh, ruined lives, um, you know, where people just never really get it together, you know, never really act on their their dreams and their visions and their commitment to life. You know, they just kind of schmooze along um, anyway. Uh, so. Um, 
as I say, it's not about getting really blasted or anything. And and in fact, uh, on this less is more notion, uh, one of the ways that I like to uh, say what the optimal dose is for working with cannabis as a spiritual medicine is the dose that you dosage that you both uh, want to and can handle. Um, so uh, want to, you know, it's like how strong you want it to be, but then the can handle part is uh, uh, means how strong of an effect can you stay calm with? Can you stay present with and not go wild in the mind? Oh, and that's what I wanted to comment upon about you were saying how it's, you know, just the thoughts get, you know, more amplified. Okay, so there's 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 like two or three probable reasons for that. Um, uh, one is that it does actually increase blood flow, and so I, interesting ideas get triggered as well. Yeah. That's the positive side. That's the creative side. But as I was saying earlier, the, the thinking is ego's um, uh, dominant primary strategy for uh, creating a you know uh, an ink cloud between us and reality and so uh, even if we think we're having really interesting thoughts and again the, and then this amplification fact uh, effect tends to make us think that our thoughts are really interesting at the time and they <laughs> yeah. may not always be right yeah, right. yeah definitely. the cynics uh, the cynics would say they're not at all yeah. but the, Lots of creative people would say, no, 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 no. There are definitely really excellent ideas that can come up and, you know, that are opened up in that state, you know, kind of a lateral thinking or, you know, whatever. Um, and I, I, I found that myself, you know, many, many times that ideas I've brought back are, are applicable oftentimes. You know, you just have to sort of sort through them, mm -hmm. you know, um, because they do seem particularly exciting at the moment. So uh, oh, yeah. as Alan, <laughs> as the, yeah, as the, as the great poetic bard Alan Ginsberg once said, and he was both a Buddhist and a devotee of the cannabis plant, um, uh, it, uh, if you write stoned, edit sober, right? Yeah. Yes. So, um, so the can handle part is, uh, you know, it's a challenge. You know, your thoughts are going to seem more interesting, maybe, and but also because it's doing the amplification, it's challenging the ego. It's challenging you to let go into something bigger, and that, of course, brings up the ego's defenses. The ego is is the most clever thing on the planet in a sense you know it uh the ego is the part of our mind that that wants to maintain this you know illusion of the separate self of this protected in the cocoon thing and when it's threatened it gets extremely creative um it will tell you lies you know oh no you can't change you can't allow this blah 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 it just gets kind of ruthless trying to protect the fortress you know um I won't mention anybody by the name of Donald Trump in that context, <laughs> <laughs> but he's a living example right in our faces, you know, like not going to let anything, you know, upset the boat, so to speak. That's ego in action, right? But we all do it. We all do it. So that's why, again, I think cannabis is an advanced spiritual medicine because uh, you're dealing with a raised energy level. And um, so uh, letting go into it can be quite a challenge. And we can trick ourselves, you know, to think that these thoughts are so interesting. I'll just follow that thought for mm -hmm. a while, right? You know, um, so if you really want to learn from it to really, really be naked in her presence, you, you have to spend at least part of the time that you work with this plant in practicing letting go and emptying your mind. And this is where the less is more of the dosage issue comes in, because the stronger the dosage, the harder that is to do. Um, because, again, it's challenging you at a deeper, more powerful level, right? Mm -hmm. So the more it's challenging you, the more it, more of a challenge it is to surrender to it. And the more the ego is going to come in and sort of try to trick you back into going, no, 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 we don't want you to change. We want to keep things just as the way they've always been, right? Um, yeah. Um, so then, you know, if you find it, you can work with it at a certain level of dosage, then, you know, you, if you want, you could go, you know, in future encounters you could you know raise the dosage and work with it like that you know so so um that begs the question in my mind anyway of of you know how to actually practice that and i would say that you know working with uh, cannabis in meditation in this kind of simple formless meditation is the ideal that you could do some of that with it. Um, and then there are, you know, many other ways that it can help open you up and relax you as well. Yoga, Tai Chi, basically any practice 
without even having to use this kind of tricky word spiritual practice you know spiritual you know right. um any anything that's that uh, you can be very present with and not have to think too much can be a benefit that way hmm. it could be even as simple as going for a walk in the woods you know if you if if you if you're not having to think about where you're going particularly you know the trail you're on or if it's well marked or whatever and you're not just having casual chat with people around you and you're just relaxing paying attention that you might call that walking meditation um you know so there are lots of different ways to uh, calm yourself and be present that don't necessarily mean completely formless mm -hmm. but i would say that the pure practice uh the, the 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 most powerful in a sense is to try to spend some time you know whether you're standing up lying down or sitting uh in just uh paying attention to your breath letting go and uh, expecting nothing just letting the medicine be there and then it can show you how to relax and open up and expand your 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 cocoon more hmm. yeah. um so let's see yeah dosage did i answer that yeah so the yeah. different methods of of uh of uh, uh administration is i guess what the technical term is methods of administration or roots of administration is the term um so smoking of course vaporizing quite similar uh some people say that um uh, there are people who are quite experienced with cannabis who say that smoking it can be a little more, a little sharper than vaporizing it. That hmm. that um, some of the cannabinoids uh, are not released in in vaporizing. I'm, you know, if there are people who have made a like a real medical scientific study of this, uh, uh, watching this interview, they they might know more about that that than I do because I'm not an expert in that area. But but just anecdotally. Uh, um, I know people that have worked with cannabis for a long time, and I th think that kind of um, you know fits my experience too. You know, because I do it both ways. I I have about three different vaporizers, and and uh, sometimes I'll I also have several little pipes and all that, and um, I kind of you know compare sometimes, and it with the same medicine, you know. And, right. It does seem to be a little stronger to me, a little sharper when you mm. smoke rather than vaporize. But, you know, that's the, one of the beautiful things about this plant. I, I like to call it the people's plant is that it's it's very amenable to experimentation. You know, I, I wouldn't say that about ayahuasca, you know, for example, I'd say if you want to take ayahuasca, go find somebody who's, you know, very, very experienced and 100 percent ethical and let them be the guide, whether it's in a private ceremony or a group ceremony or whatever. But with cannabis, uh, you know, for the most part, although in certain kinds of dosage and routes of administration, it can be overwhelming um, for the most part when you start with less is more and are careful and you know the particular medicine you're working with, especially. Yeah, again, less is more also applies to working with a new medicine that you haven't tried before. Right. Definitely. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, uh, then it's safe, you know, and it's safe to um, experiment with. So again, in terms of practices, that's another thing I've been working with, too, is doing group ceremonies, leading them. Uh, and we've been doing meditation, uh, that kind of meditation and mixing in a little bit of movement, yoga, mm -hmm. sort of yoga light, you might say. Um, sound sound uh, can be very powerful. I have things like Tibetan gongs that you can, you know, hit and last a long time. And I just ask people to empty themselves into that. So, mm. so this notion of emptying yourself into an external uh, focus, like a sound, is is you know is a really good way to work with it. Again, it's almost the same as working with it in just em pure emptiness, so to speak. You know. Um, and and it depends on the person's experience, perhaps, with meditation as well. Like if you've never done that kind of meditation, maybe it's easier to approach it gradually. I'm just guessing, really, you know, but approach approach that state gradually through having, you know, what you might even call the crutch of some form, you know, whether it be yoga or um, certain kinds of uh, sound, uh, mm -hmm. you know, things that you create. I've got a crystal bowl that... Uh, you know, you run around the rim, and it, it's a, it's it has this incredible sustain, and uh, it's a really beautiful sound. And I've used that in the ceremonies, and people really mm. like that. Um, we do some ohm chanting, mm. you know, just that'd be amazing. Um, 
Yeah. Oh, it is actually. <laughs> I don't know how much time we have, but <laughs> I could tell I could tell you in like one or two minutes. Um, I did a book launch for cannabis and spirituality back last January. This past January, we rented a a, a former church hall, now a community center, beautiful space. There were 130 people came, and uh, uh, I had some of the contributors from uh, to the books speak very briefly and then we told people what we were going to do we sent them outside to have a puff we had a couple of people there that had uh, joints uh, pre-rolls available um, and they still all stepped outside or most of them did and got high and came back in and um, we sat in silence for a couple of minutes uh, we had uh, um, uh, some people from the Santo Daime church sang us a, a cannabis song they call it Santa Maria hmm. we had a guy lead us then we had a guy lead us in om chanting and just you know all you and 130 people he had a, a thing called a shruti box which is mm -hmm. like a indian harmonium without the keys it just you use it for drones just, oh, wow. you know yeah so the note by the way that works best if if you haven't experimented with it and want to is right around c c sharp or d those notes um, are a good balance of male and female voices can mm -hmm. fit into that and go oh you know um, so we had 130 people with this really acoustically lovely um, uh, church space, um, all ohm chanting with this guy. He was using a microphone, and he's one of these sort of throat singer type guys that can do real stuff. Um, and he's got the shruti box going, and uh, it was really exquisite. I mean, uh, you know, a whole bunch of us, including me, felt that was the highlight of the of the wow. night was was just you know uh, because you uh, you're creating a vibration, right? Um, the sadhus say that, uh, you know, that the chants that they do, that it's not in the words, not the meaning of the words or the translation of them into English that matters. It's that you're actually generating a vibration. Mm. So there's all these different practices that you can, as, as I said, ap apply to working with cannabis that, that way. And the, uh, and the other one I was going to mention was a group ceremony, you know, and there's a chapter I, I put into the book about offering people a kind of a, a flexible template that they could work with. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing, man. I never really, I never really thought of it um, being used in that way. And, I mean, I think in the in the West, you know, especially in the U.S., um, most people look at cannabis as kind of like a medication to take, kind of, or an escape, mm -hmm. a way to escape reality for a moment and then come back to it, like a relief. And they don't really look at it as like something that can um, produce long-term um, psychological changes. And mm -hmm. that's a question I really wanted to ask you is. Um, I recently stumbled on to um, uh, marijuana being um, being something that makes people highly suggestible and and mm. it was like peer-reviewed yeah. research talking about that but what I they were trying to you know promote the idea that it was a negative thing that this highly suggestible way of being is like you know bad for people and and you know in some contexts it could be but um, I saw the other side. I saw, well, if it's highly suggestible, that means people can make real changes. They could be hypnotized in a way from their self and they can make real long lasting changes. So um, I was wondering if you've had any people or if, you know, yourself have experienced some long term changes from cannabis use that um, you can talk about. Right. Um... Yeah. Well, you know, to be honest, uh, to be really sort of, you know, uh, rigorously honest, I suppose you could say about that. Uh, it's hard to say because um, how do you uh, isolate one factor? You know, if the only thing you're doing is uh, cannabis uh, and, you know, and maybe a little meditation, and maybe you could, you know, uh, you know, uh, identify changes in your life over time. But I've also used, you know, many of these other medicines. And also, if you did no medicines, no cannabis, uh, there's a good chance that you might calm down as you age as well, yeah. right? So, yeah. you know, how you isolate one factor, I, I really yeah. don't know. But but I honestly do feel that process that I described earlier in the conversation. Uh, uh, can very well um, uh, occur, which is, your, um, it's it's the same reason why meditation has a long-term accumul accumulative benefit potentially, right? Is that, um, you know, again, you know, if you sit down in that kind of meditation, the way it was taught to me was, you just uh, gently put your attention on your breath because the breath is real, right? I mean, it's as real as things get in this realm. Um, you don't 
and it, it's so real that you don't even have to think about it. You don't like you, you breathe all night while you're unconsciously asleep, right? So the breath is just happening. You don't have to make it happen. Um, and in fact, you, you know, you're not suggested to try to consciously breathe deeper or anything in a meditation practice. You just let it come, let it go, let it come, let it go. And, um, and, and use that as an anchor to come back into being fully present with all your senses present in this moment, right? And then what happens is whether it's five seconds later, or, you know, a minute later, five minutes later, um, and this is always kind of interesting. It's sort of like, I don't know, for some reason, I, I, I used to try to see if I could track the, the second or moment when I fell asleep, but you can't, right? You're there and then you're not there. Right. So it, 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 yeah, the same with thoughts when you're meditating is that you, um, you know, you're, you're there, you know, you're gently not, not hyper focusing on the breath. It's not like a super concentration thing. It's just using the breath to be present uh, in the space, in your body, in the space around you. Uh, in fact, we were even taught to meditate with eyes open mm. because it's not trying to create some holy special practice. It's just trying to uh, develop or train yourself to be more present so that, you know, the, the other 15 hours a day when you're not sitting down meditating, you're you're doing the same thing. You know, the aim isn't to spend your life sitting in meditation. The aim is to be relaxed, present, open hearted and intelligent in your life as you move through it. Right. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, you use this practice to uh, train yourself to recognize that the thoughts come up. They're not actually you, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, we, we get what you might call over identified with all these stories, the narrative package that I referred to earlier. We get over, we, we take it seriously. We take it for real in the moment and in general, but in the moment, you know, say, like, oh, uh, now I'm upset. Now I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, you know, but uh, it's if you see the, the, the material arise, you know, so you're, you're, you're suddenly gone, as I said, into thinking, you're in your head. Uh, and then at a certain point, you recognize that you're in your head, you may be lost in it for a while, it could be, you know, a minute, two minutes, five minutes, it doesn't matter from the point of view, of, you know, the teachings of meditation. So just whenever you, you know, kind of realize, oh, yeah, I just spent the last 20 minutes uh, planning my day tomorrow, or deciding how I'm going to fit cement boots to my boss, right? Um, <laughs> um, uh, because of the things that he said to me yesterday. Um, uh, and so, you know, you, you don't judge that, you know, they, they say no praise, no blame, right? It's just a thought. It doesn't actually have any reality until you give it power, right? Um, so it could be a thought that you want to strangle somebody. It could be a thought that, you know, um, you're so happy you're going to be getting a promotion or, you know, it could be anything. It, it could be just song going through your head. Mm. It could be, you know, oh, I'm so great because I can sit in meditation. You know, it's no praise, no blame. It, you re start to realize, hopefully, this is the long-term accumulation of learning part, uh, you start to recognize that you are not your thoughts. Mm. There is something deeper, this unconditional reality that, 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 you know, is encompassing and underneath all that. Right. Um, and so that's an accumulated process again, as I say, and, yeah. uh, and again, where cannabis comes in is you can practice those kind of practices and find a dosage that you can work with, amplify it up a little bit, maybe go more and more and more, et cetera, right? And just keep going deeper. I don't even know if I answered the question that triggered no, that anymore. It, it, yeah. it makes sense, man. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm looking for something where it's like you're yeah. taking cannabis and you're having some type of um, psychedelic type experience, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But what you're, yeah. what you're t telling me, it sounds like, is that it's a, it's a long-term tool. It's not something that you take once and then you yeah. have an experience and you're like, you know, it's like get your act together kind of thing like ayahuasca would mm -hmm. do. Yeah. It's more of like a relationship. And then it's a tool, an amplifying tool that amplifies your thoughts so that when you start meditating, you can kind of gradually increase your um, the, the thoughts and the challenges that you're going to face. And eventually yeah. you get to a point where it's kind of um, those those thoughts, you realize those thoughts are not part of you and, and you can let them go. Yeah, that you, kinda... you, it's a it's a moment by moment practice of working with that. You know, you know, I'm not I'm not saying you should never indulge your thinking when you're using cannabis, uh, because you know, although it's also, 
you know, ego's primary strategy of avoidance, uh, you can deliberately, uh, you know, encourage or not encourage, but work with certain kinds of insights and thoughts that come up. And that's fine, too, as long as you're aware that you might also be fooling yourself if you do too much of that. Right. So it's not so much that you're kind of developing a relationship with amplified thoughts. It's that when you recognize them, uh, that they've arisen, that um, in the in the sort of most rigorous or pure practice, as it were, uh, you you let them go right then, hmm. because it's in the emptiness. You know, um, uh, do you know who Rumi is, the Persian mystic poet? Uh, Rumi. I've, I've heard of him. Yes. Oh yeah, he's he's fantastic actually, um, and he writes all these. He has written all these. He's a 13th century Persian mystic who who, as far as I can tell, really got it, you know, and writes these beautiful little short poems, quatrains, and things like that. And he he all over his work is this reference to inner silence, that you know he has quotes like, um, "Silence is the language of God. All else is poor translation," or. Um, uh, look beyond your thoughts to drink the pure nectar of this moment. You know that that it's by emptying the the small self. You know which is this thought-based narrative package, is where wisdom is allowed to enter. Hmm. So it's it, ultimately we have to we have to be able to train our minds, and it's again a long time process. I think long learning process to allow ourselves to be empty. Now, Eckhart Tolle was really good on that one, I think, in his book, The Power of Now. Uh, I, I wouldn't underestimate that book. It, uh, when I first read it, uh, it was recommended to me by a friend, and I, you know, I'd been studying Buddhism for a long time, and at first I thought it was Buddhism light, you know, but then I realized it, what it really was, was it, he actually got the, the, the essence of it, and he just didn't, you know, kind of complicate it with, you know, sort of, you know, yeah. elaborate it teachings of buddhism or something but um he says the ideal relationship the rela relationship you want to cultivate uh in working with your thinking mind is that you think of it as a tool that when you need it you can pick it up and use it but when you don't actually need it you can put it back down again and uh rather than it running you which is again what 99 percent of us are more uh, that's the kind of condition we find ourselves in is that um, the, our thoughts are as well as all the applicability uh, functions that they have are also uh, creating an obscuration from a reality that is right there in front of us mm -hmm. all the time yeah um, so yeah so so I think what you you know how you summed it up was good uh, but just with the clarification that uh, it's actually about learning how to let an empty space happen in between mm. the thoughts, you know, and that's where uh, the unconditional uh, awakened state can start to appear. That makes yeah. sense, man. There, that's a good point too. Yeah. Um, never really thought about the empty space in between the thoughts being kind mm -hmm. of the the goal with the meditation. They call it the gap. They the call gap. it the gap. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. As opposed to the one where you go and get clothes, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the one where you go and get naked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> find your true yeah. self um yeah so I, i've heard people using cannabis um in combination with other uh psychedelics and i wanted to see what your perspective of that was um you know maybe some warnings or um some positives in there i don't i don't really i've never used cannabis with other psychedelics or anything like that mm -hmm. so i don't know i wanted to get the expert's opinion Oh, sure. Thanks. No, I, I, I like that question uh, because I think it has really great potential to benefit uh, working with some other uh, uh, psychedelics. Uh, but if, you know, if you'll accept my principle that cannabis by itself is an advanced spiritual medicine, doing it with other medicines is even more advanced mm. and more, more tricky. Um, be, excuse me. Because um, uh, it, what, it potent, what it can do uh, is uh, strengthen or what is called potentiate the the effects of the other medicine. I think of cannabis as a, an extremely kind, gracious medicine. It will allow you to uh, misuse it, you know, and um, it will just kind of ruin you slowly if you do that. Um, you know, it's not going to put you over the edge like heroin or something, but it'll just kind of undermine 
uh, your activity in the world to some degree, potentially, if you overuse it or use it for the with the intention is everything. You know, this is the 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 kind of the the, the foundation of the building is what is your intention? If your intention is to escape, cannabis will amplify that intention gra gracefully, graciously for you. Mm. If your intention is to uh, wake up, heal, see the truth, uh, again, you can channel her energy that way. Um, so um, uh, she will also graciously support other psychedelic medicines. Um, and actually, she can help with, uh, you know, um, pharmaceutical medicines as well, not, not to potentiate the effects, but to um, uh, people have found oftentimes that they can lower the dosages of their other uh, pharmacy, their legal pharmaceuticals that they're taking for medical reasons, mm -hmm. oftentimes they can they significantly lower the dosage of, that they're taking when they include cannabis in the regime. Um, but we're, t we're talking about, you know, for spiritual awakening now, uh, uh, cannabis can, can taken in conjunction with uh, some of these other medicines can potentiate the effects. It can also sort of uh, soothe or smooth them out a little bit without mm -hmm. actually um, counteracting them. Uh, and it can sometimes help clarify. It's as if it gives a brings in a warmth sometimes, um, uh, <clears throat> in some ways. Uh, so, for example, uh, with ayahuasca, uh, some uh, lineages of the Santo Daime Church, the ayahuasca using syncretic church that uh, originated in Brazil and is spreading around the world now, uh, some of those lineages. Uh, are also devotees of cannabis that they call Santa Maria, hmm. Saint Mary, and uh, um, the way there's two chapters in the book that talk about how you can use uh, cannabis uh, carefully with ayahuasca, and in one of them, this fellow is an ayahuasca expert shaman uh, or ayahuascaro, and he's also very very skilled using cannabis as a spiritual medicine, and what he says is. Uh, the only time they would combine cannabis with the ayahuasca ceremonies is when it's uh, um, a people he knows well. He wouldn't do this in a public venue. Uh, he would only do it with like a small group of people that he knows are experienced with ayahuasca and probably with cannabis. So he knows they can handle it. And he said what they might do is they they'll do uh, a first round of ayahuasca at the beginning of the ceremony. Then they'll do some uh, sing some songs and some silent meditation. And then a couple hours later, they'll two, three hours later, they'll have another round of ayahuasca. And he said when they're going to include cannabis, that's when they would do it after the second round. Hmm. And he said it's absolutely essential that there be both inner silence and external silence when you do that, like no singing, no nothing going on. Um, because you have to really connect with it because it's empowering it. And the way he describes it in the book, I've always loved the way that he said this, was essentially that in that condition, if you can surrender, if you can relax, if you can let go, uh, the ayahuasca takes you to the top of the mountain and the Santa Maria or cannabis gives you wings to fly in the wind. Hmm. Um, so it has this remarkable potential to support other medicines. Uh, but again, we're talking about very power, potentially very powerful experiences. You really have to know what you're doing uh, in general to do that, you know, mm -hmm. and should probably be doing it with people who are very experienced and not just jumping into doing something like that. Uh, uh, on the other hand, well, not exactly the, the other hand, but somewhere in between the two hands, <laughs> um, uh, uh, it can also be quite beneficial uh, in, in a much safer way with uh, you know, sort of microdose levels of, mm. of things like LSD and uh, psilocybin mushrooms, or, or, you know, sort of slightly above threshold mm. level. Um, microdose is considered to sort of like below threshold, where you don't right. necessarily feel like you've taken a psychedelic. You just might find you a little sharper, a little more energy, or a little calmer, or whatever. Um, but if you do a small dosage of mushroom, you know, in the sort of quarter to half gram range or whatever, um, and then uh, wait till that's kicked in and you see where that sort of sits. That's one way of doing it. I'm not saying that's the only way to do it, um, but uh, that's one way. It's, you know, see what the, that effect is, if it's a little bit above the microdose level, but not too strong, um, and then have a puff. Maybe not much, you know, especially mm -hmm. if with a high THC, one or two puffs maybe. Um, and what'll probably happen at that point is that we'll both smooth out a little bit, but also strengthen the effect of the mushroom. Mm. 
and and sharpen actually. Interesting. So, for example, um, what, uh, uh, my my personal use, and I'm not saying this is the template for anybody else. They do what they want. Oh, so but if I can not lose that track, I just want to back up slightly to the less is more idea also applies to frequency of use. Now, some people can in, in, uh, make cannabis uh, uh, an effective and healthy part of their life if they're doing it daily. Of course, medical reasons, that's different. But even just to, it, it, it's, it's described as um, having homeostatic balancing effects um, balances the flow to both sides of the brain um, and uh, can settle people into a kind of a zone that seems to be f more functional for them take a little bit of an edge off certain things and allow them to fo focus more almost the way that somebody might use ritalin for adhd or something right um, uh, so there's that but that can also lead to a kind of a, a dependence uh, that's not healthy for a lot of people. So I, I suspect people need to be careful with that depending on the person. However, the, the p potential downside to doing it every day is that it, it uh, there's a tolerance effect. So people like this fellow I mentioned a few moments ago that's worked with ayahuasca and cannabis, he says that uh, you should try to keep it down to like not much more than about once a week if you can, you know, um, uh, because it'll be a lot sharper um, if, you, if your intention is to open up, you know, to go kind of deeper, you know, this sort of like uh, what you can handle optimal dosage idea, uh, then if you've left some time, like in minimum, say, four or five days from the last one, and in fact, the longer you can leave it, the better in some ways, because it does stay in the body for quite a while. Mm -hmm. You can measure cannabis, I think, in the spinal cord or spinal column up to a month or so after, right? Mm -hmm. It does linger. Um, uh, so uh, I was just going to say that uh, 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 oftentimes the way <clears throat> I do it is twice a week. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, once one of those is just on my own where I'm meditating and maybe uh, indulging the creative thought somewhat as well and maybe getting hooked <laughs> without knowing it as i said <laughs> into the thinking <clears throat> but i keep coming back right so, you know when i recognize that i keep coming back to some silent sitting or whatever um but the other one is because um i play music with my friend um, many weekends uh, he comes over and we kind of jam on guitars and whatnot and so um, we make that into a kind of a quasi ceremony, a ceremony light, you know. Mm. So we 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 uh, uh, dedicate to the plant, you know. Uh, we um, uh, ask each other if there's anybody we want to send out a good intention to, like a prayer. Uh, we sit in silence for three or four minutes. Then we have maybe two tokes, and then we sit in silence for another five to ten minutes, and then we play music. Wow. And then we, we may repeat that process about an hour to an hour and a half later. So uh, the, the reason I'm mentioning that, apart from just telling people that's one way I use it, is that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, last weekend uh, we had a um, very small mushroom chocolate, like a quarter of a gram hmm. first. Um, and then we had, we didn't wait for an hour to see what the effect was. We, we did our thing that I just described and then had a couple of puffs. And I found I was a little too high to be able to play music properly. I was, you know, it became a little bit too uh, fuzzy there. And um, so uh, when we took our break about an hour later, uh, I thought, well, geez, I'm pretty high. I don't know if I want to have another puff because it might be even more. But I remembered that cannabis can have this sort of other effect. Mm -hmm. And so I had one more toke. And in fact, it did exactly what I hoped it would. It sharpened me up a lot. Hmm. It brought in this kind of, I can only describe it as a kind of a warmth, you know. Um, it's as if it relaxes the whole thing. Can't, the, the mushroom, even at these small doses, can have a sort of an edge, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so the cannabis warmed it up or smoothed it out a little bit and sharpened me right back up. And I, for the rest of the evening, had no trouble, uh, you know, uh, playing, you know, because we improvise, we, you know, do solos and stuff like that uh, on the guitars you know in you know in in between verses and things like that and I, I just felt like I was right back you know on track when I did that so that's the you know that's one way that can work with these other plants there's another thing that I want to say about that by the way uh, that I think is uh, important for a lot of people because um, this is kind of potentially a big topic I'll try to you know you know it down to something simple here uh, Arguably, we're in deep doo-doo as a species right now. 
many people who are paying attention would say we're really at the edge of potential potentially destroying ourselves for the time being at least you know for the next several hundred or several thousand years this we could be making the planet inhabitable for human species and a lot of others of course as well um uh it, it, intu intuitively and um you know kind of scientifically you might say it appears that we simply cannot go on the current trajectory of resource extraction and you know just dis you know poisoning the planet essentially air earth and water um, bringing down the trees that provide oxygen for human life etc 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 cutting down the biodiversity and on and on and on right um, uh, so uh, there are many people and I would include myself in that in that number believe that we are in a very urgent situation and what's actually needed is a rapid uh, and widespread consciousness revolution and this is why these medicines are so powerful because uh, are so needed right now because um, uh, the way I like to think of it is when the patient, the, the more ill the patient is, the stronger the medicine you need. And so these are strong medicines to work with uh, the illness of illusion, right? And they're badly needed right now. And uh, so uh, cannabis is one of those that can help with that. And again, I'm sorry, I kind of for I got so far along <laughs> on that that I forgot what the original question it's was. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, uh, um, with with the say you know you have somebody that's oh go ahead i just remember okay, yeah sorry <laughs> it was um uh that uh people involved in spiritual work who are doing other kinds of spiritual work that are involved with things like hinduism and buddhism and yoga practice and so on uh a, a certain percentage of those people have a uh, what i would consider a dogmatic view that psychedelics are not appropriate or they're cheating you know, yeah. or it's an artificial awakening. It's not an artificial awakening, and it's not a kind of shortcut. Uh, yes, you can have extremely powerful awakening experiences, but you still have to integrate them back into your daily life. So what they are is they're amplifiers that can contribute to speeding up your awakening, but only, again, if you know how to integrate them into your daily life. Uh, so um, I, I, what I would like to say to those people who reject the use of psychedelics in combination or as an adjunct to or whatever with other spiritual traditions and practices is we need to go past that at this time. You know, there may have been reasons to do that in the past, but right now humanity needs all the help it can get to wake up. And these medicines, when they're used properly, have that potential. There's no doubt whatsoever that the millions of people who have used them properly have found that. And that it, you know, you asked quite a while ago is, you know, uh, can cannabis actually contribute to a long-term awakening? And I can't prove it. And again, because I don't just do cannabis, um, I can't isolate it either. But my sense and my intuition is that, yes, if you use it carefully and you um, uh, integrate, you know, in a daily way, you know, by being as present as possible and relaxed as possible and learning to trust your mind as possible, it definitely can contribute to this mm -hmm. awakening because it is about trusting the moment. The, this is, again, a core Buddhist teaching is that that we have all the intelligence we need, what they might call primordial intelligence, that beyond all concept, beyond all belief systems or, you know, any of that stuff, in the moment, we have the intelligence to recognize reality, to be able to separate truth from falsity. Uh, you know, our bullshit detectors can be polished up very, very finely. <laughs> and cannabis can help with that. <laughs> I believe. Uh, yeah, that makes sense, yeah. man. And that's very clear. Yeah. Um, I guess w my question would be, so uh -huh. say you take a person that's not um, usually, you know, cannabis and psychedelics in general attract people that are already kind of interested in changing their minds in a way. Mm -hmm. So if somebody that wasn't interested in changing their mind, they were obsessed with their thoughts, they had no, um, you know, previous training on thought awareness or anything like that, and they took cannabis or a psychedelic, do you think it would benefit them the same way as somebody else? Or do you think it may drive them into a different in a darker way? Yeah, well, that's a good question, because uh, uh, 
you know this 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 non-specific amplifier potential right um you know uh i co-organize a spirit plant medicine conference and the sort of central mission of our conference is to try to bring people the kind of information that can help them understand how you can work with these powerful medicines <clears throat> that you know if you play around with them you know even like the mushrooms are so available to a lot of people these days right yes people can you know, uh, just, you know, on their own, have some very, very interesting experiences, and that might turn them more toward a spiritual life or a spiritual awakening process. Um, but without having some kind of uh, container where you're, you know, have an intention, and you're perhaps having a guide or, you know, working with other people so that you're focused together or whatever, or even if it's on your own, uh, you know, just doing it in a way in a safe place and, you know, having the intention to, as Terrence McKenna used to say, sit down, shut up and pay attention. Um, uh, you know, that's wholly different from, you know, just taking some mushrooms and, you know, hanging out with your friends and going to a party and maybe mixing in a little beer and a little cannabis or whatever, you know, uh, at, you know, it can be dangerous. Uh, but it but it can also be that you're missing what these things can do because they can dissolve the ego into these unconditioned uh, reality of these the, the, the truth as it were right and if you don't give it some time where you can sit down shut up and pay attention you're not giving it the the space to do that whatever the medicine is right um, so yes and and the danger part of it and this you know has happened a lot I don't know how much it happens now but uh, when I was 20 in that range uh you know there were a lot of people taking pretty strong doses of lsd acid we called it usually uh with no attention to set and setting to a container to safety whatsoever you know doing it in almost any circumstances you could imagine you know in a car you know at a party whatever and what can happen is uh that you know especially in the strong doses these substances like lsd can dissolve the ego they can they can show you that this personality thing this you know persona that you've so carefully nurtured for 20 years or whatever is empty it doesn't exist it's it's phony it's just a concoction it's a it's a clown in a sense you know um well that's kind of a harsh way of putting it but it's <laughs> It, it actually, I've seen it, you know, um, uh, someone very close to me um, had what we used to call a bummer on acid one time, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, where she she realized uh, that her whole game was, was, was phony, was false, that she'd created a false persona um, to meet the world and to fit in, to, to cope and make herself feel like she was okay and all that stuff. And she just saw through all that. But because she had no guidance, there was nobody there to say, this is a fantastic thing you've just seen. Let go, relax, trust, and it'll change. And it'll open up into something real. Um, she freaked. And she had a horrible trip. And just like really, really horrible to the point where she changed her li literally changed her life overnight. Mm. She she was a she was a she was a uh, like a r real full on hippie. You know, she she looked like one. She um, she was very artistic. She did all these different arts, macrame and tie dye and batik mm. and bead work. And she played music and she dumped everything. She changed her appearance. She stopped doing all those things and she decided that her uh, lack her, her area of lack was that she wasn't educated she never finished high school that was a sense of like i'm incomplete and this and this was was her idea of what she needed to do to complete herself so she went into university and um, became hyper focused worked her bump up, butt off and you know became a top student uh, but completely rejected who she had been before so oh. i would say she threw out the baby with the bathwater <laughs> yeah, uh, in that regard you know and 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 generated a, a persona that was a, 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 a not completely dysfunctional or anything, but a, a much smaller version of who she might have been, had she been in the right kind of condition, and somebody around her had been there to say, mm -hmm. "Let go, yeah. die, die to that old self right now," and then you're going to find a new self, which is at a much higher level. Um, so yes, there are distinct dangers in working with these substances. And again, that's what the conference is for to point out to people that there are, there are, there are, you know, ways to work with these substances that 
Um, if you don't, at the very least, you're probably going to miss what they can really do as, a, as spiritual medicines, because very few people fully understand what that is as a basic understanding, you know, regardless of the medicines. Yeah. Um, and at worst, you can, you know, with LSD, people, um, you can go through some such intense stuff that if you get into something really traumatic, and that happens, uh, Stanislav Grof is a great pioneer of work in this field. He he supervised as the chief psychiatrist, I think he was the chief psychiatrist of a psychiatric hospital in Czechoslovakia using LSD, uh, uh, I think between 1953 and 1966. He supervised over 5,000 um, guided or, you know, uh, guided in the sense of having a sitter LSD sessions hmm. uh, with patients there. And he wrote books about this where essentially what happened with these patients was they, on their own, without any direction from him or the, the, the sitter, went to where the deepest trauma was. And oftentimes it was birth trauma, but it could be, you know, anything. It could mm -hmm. be abandonment by parents or, you know, sometimes it was even in previous lives. Um, so LSD could take you there. Uh, not just LSD, but it could take you there. And if you're just doing that sitting on the beach with some friends and you suddenly find yourself <laughs> reliving a trauma from your childhood, that is a horrible thing if yeah, you can't process rough. it. And people actually literally got stuck in those places. This mm -hmm. is what the you know the experts would say. You have to go through it. That's why with LSD uh, therapy, you have to stay with it, go right to the depth of it, and it'll keep changing, and it will eventually open up or resolve itself hmm. but if you get into a trauma state and you then stop if you freeze it there because you're afraid you're terrified you're actually sticking yourself in there and you can hmm. potentially get stuck there in a way that affects your your you know your daily life you know it it, it happened with people um, I know people that literally went crazy you know ended up in psychiatric institutions because of having those experiences with LSD um, so yes, absolutely important to do these things right. Yeah. Um, yeah. with your comment on trauma, it uh, seems like, uh, generations, you know, today, um, are trying to get away from trauma as much as possible rather than face mm -hmm. it. So it seems that, mm. um, it's mm. going in a, in a negative direction in that way. And that mm. maybe your generation was more willing to face the trauma and kind of move through it. So it's interesting, um, you know, psychedelics may be even more important in, in the near future with this, the newest generation growing up, maybe something mm -hmm. that, uh, and it's, and it may be at the right time because it seems like a lot of these things are becoming, uh, legalized, um, in both countries. So mm -hmm. hopefully, hopefully change for the better. I wanted to talk about your conference real quick before, um, our time runs sure. out. So, um, tell me a little bit about your conference and, um, maybe some of the guest speakers this year and what, you know, like the plans of the future are as well for the conference. Cause mm. I know it, it continually goes on each year, I think. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's where it's, it's in the eighth year now it's called the spirit plant medicine conference. And if anyone's hearing this, watching this, that wants to check it out. Uh, it's uh, uh, spiritplantmedicine.com is the website and people can buy tickets to come to it. Uh, um, and I'd like to just reference back to uh, a comment that I made earlier that, you know, the, the, the humanity in, a, in a, an urgent condition, that, that, uh, <clears throat> that a, a widespread consciousness uh, transformation or revolution is urgently called for at this time. And so that's essentially what the conference is about. It's not just this sort of little niche talking about psychedelic substances, right? It's that the psychedelic substances are uh, potentially the most powerful and direct way of healing and awakening into unconditioned reality if they're understood properly and used uh, effectively and skillfully and that's so that's what the conference is for and um, and then we just try to find the best people we can find to come in and talk about it and um, about that in whatever ways they can and or they with the, from you know their knowledge and understanding experience so um, for example uh, probably the best known of all the speakers this year is Paul Stamets 
um, he's well known uh, for several reasons. I was just actually looking at his book again. It's the first book I heard about from him called uh, Psilocybin oh, Mushrooms yeah. of the World. Yeah, this is still 33 years after it was published, considered <laughs> nice. the, the Bible for psilocybin mushroom identification, I believe. Um, uh, but then he also went on to, into just how mushrooms can save the world, period. Not psychedelic mushrooms, not from uh, consciousness change, but uh, the things that they can do is just almost beyond belief. Uh, um, you know, uh, neutralize oil spills, you know, many, many things they can do. They're, they're basically the builders and the, the supporters of, 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 of biological life on this planet. Um, and so he got into all that. So he got, became very well known with some of that. And he actually, uh, uh, more recently came up or just started marketing um, medicinal mushrooms, hmm. uh, specific mushrooms like chaga, reishi, and lion's mane, and some others uh, uh, as anti-cancer and some other uh, things. So he's become well known in, in those ways, but he also has a deep understanding of, of um, uh, the consciousness changing potential of psilocybin mushrooms. So he's one. Uh, Dennis McKenna, brother of Terence McKenna, uh, at the age of about 70, is actually becoming better known than he has been in the past, strangely enough. I don't <laughs> quite know why. Maybe he goes he goes and talks at a lot of conferences, yeah, so that might be part why. of it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, he's wonderful. He's a super brilliant guy. And um, uh, I'm, I'm really excited about the Friday evening of the conference because it's going to be, the whole evening is going to be given over to him and Wade Davis. Hmm. Um, I'm always surprised at how, how how many people don't know Wade Davis. Uh, I think he's a little less visible in the culture than he used to be. He got he got fairly famous back in I think the mid '80s when he uh, wrote a book. Uh, it was an anthropological study of the Voodooan religion in Haiti hmm. called The Serpent and the Rainbow. And what really made him well known was that there, a Hollywood movie was made by that name about based on his book hmm. um, and he's written many books he's probably you know the solo author to about 10 or 12 books and has co-authored another couple of dozen as well so uh, you know he's at this amazing level he has been that's why I'm always surprised at how many people don't know him because he's things like he's been National Geographic Society's explorer and residence where they've put him on a private plane and flew him around the world for a year, you know, giving talks in all these different countries. Um, he's just really been around and he's also a, um, one of the, I exaggerate not, he's one of the most eloquent people I've ever heard talk. Uh, he's just got that gift, you know. So he and Dennis, they're both going to give half hour talks and then they're going to sit down and have what you might call a fireside chat. Um, Dennis's talk is going to be climbing the vine, 45 years of ayahuasca. Um, and uh, Wade is going to, his little short talk is going to be called Smoking Toad. And I think it's about uh, some of his travel adventures in South America in the past. And uh, the toad I think he's referring to is the one that produces the, um, the medicine, the psychedelic called 5-MeO-DMT which some people consider the uh, sine qua non, the, uh, the, or maybe that's not the right word, uh, Latin phrase, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the medicine non pari, um, uh, <clears throat> that uh, when understood or uh, when, it ha when it has its you know, best effectiveness, can introduce people or you know, like literally grab people by the short hairs and pull them into the non-dual state of awakening right there and then in a, in a few seconds. Um, uh, like even more effective and powerful and clearer than, uh, than just DMT, which also is short acting similar substance. Um, anyway, so he's gonna talk about that. And then there's Paul Stamets, as I said. Another one of the people I'm most excited about uh, is a fellow named Chris ba Bache, actually, B-A-C-E-C-H-E. -E. Uh, and his story is unbelievable. He, he's a retired university professor from Youngstown, Ohio. Um, and uh, he got interested in the work of Stan Groff when he was fresh out of uh, uh, graduate school in his LSD therapy that I referred to earlier. And, uh, and so what he did was he took, undertook a 20-year journey of 73 high dose LSD sessions hmm. uh, with a sitter, just him and a sitter, eye coverings on, some carefully curated playlist uh, music uh, to guide him or accompany him or whatever. And the experiences he had are, are just 
they beg or believe. He literally traveled and it kept going deeper. Like there, he was actually dealing with living intelligences that were saying, okay, Chris, here you are. Let's see how far you can go out of yourself. You know, there has to be a purification process, an ego death process, like I referred to earlier, and why these substances can be really dangerous if you don't know what you're doing, et cetera, et cetera, and can't go through it. But this is where you do go through it. And and, and you have the, 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 the wherewithal, the courage, the determination, the persistence, and the experience to keep going when you hit these places that could be frightening because your old self is just literally dissolving. Um, and then when you do, you go into these much vaster places that are actually kind of like at the core of eternal intelligence or whatever. And over this 20 year period of 73 sessions, the, the, he calls it the universe. I think he's kind of trying to avoid, you know, uh, language with baggage like um, mm. God or whatever. Yeah. So the universe kept talking to him and taking him he'd, like the next session, he, they would meet him exactly where he left off the last mm. time. You went this far last time. Let's go let's see if you can go a little further and still stay present and not freak out here, Chris. Um, and so they just took him deeper and deeper and deeper into the the nature of life or mind or you know eternal existence altogether. It's quite stunning. Hmm. Um, uh, so I'm really looking forward to him as well. And then we have quite a few people of all different. We took people talking about iboga and psilocybin mushrooms and ayahuasca and um, some people just talking about the indigenous. Uh, worldview a woman named dr claudia ford is going to she's uh, half native and half Amer uh, african-american going to talk about um, indigenous people's worldview about how to understand plants and our relationship to them in general not specifically psychedelics um you know a, a cannabis uh spiritual person not me <laughs> I'll, I'll be the mc so yeah. i don't want to be a speaker i don't want to be a speaker as well uh, I, I think I've invented a word for that. Uh, that would, you know what the word nepotism means? Oh, no. What, what's that? Uh, nepotism is uh, when somebody is hiring, uh, they're kind of bypassing proper channels mm. for hiring people, and they just bring in their relatives. You oh, know? yeah. It's kind of like, that's what Trump did with his kids. That's <laughs> we call it that's conflict of interest. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> so that's nepotism. So I, I figure if I talked at the conference, that would be auto nepotism. Yeah. The self nepotism. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so, you know, that's what we're doing. Um, and it's also, I just want to say briefly, it has a, uh, a wonderful um, energy uh, for uh, a community kind of uh, feel to it. People really connect with each other. It's not just about coming to hear these so-called experts. It's about meeting other people of similar interests and aspirations. And uh, a lot of, I, I've talked to, you know, they say if you, t you know, one person, you know, so, so like uh, wrote, you know, an editor about something, you can assume that, you know, several dozen, dozen other people had the same thought, but didn't do it, right? Oh, yeah. So, so I've talked, talked to a few people and can assume there's many more that have actually told me that that conference changed their life hmm. because they, they got connected to some, you know, way of working with these medicines and took on a different view of them and then got into something and then they really went with it, you know, or for whatever in, an, in a variety of ways. So it's, it's actually, uh, I, I feel really good about the conference as nice. a way of helping people connect with each other as well. Well, it's great that you're, you're doing that. And it sounds like it's, I mean, it's going to be, it's a lot of work that you put in there, I'm sure. And so the payoff is, you know, changing people's um, desires and their minds for the future. And hopefully that helps them out. And, and I've talked to um, a couple of people as well. And every person I've talked to has said really good things about the conference and, um, a lot of people, um, they're going again this year because they enjoyed it in the past, nice. maybe a year ago yeah. or the year before that. So it, uh, I mean, I'm going myself this year and I'm excited to, to oh, go there and meet you and Dennis and a few other people, hopefully, and um, build those connections like you're talking about and really, um, you know, connect with people. That's my kind of my desire as well. So it sounds like yeah, something excellent. that I'll be enjoying as well. Um, is oh, there... I'm glad you're coming. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, well, now I'll, I'll recognize you, presumably. <laughs> yeah, do, do, do come up and give me a man hug or something. Okay, definitely. Um, yeah, man. Uh, and you're going to be interviewing Claudia Ford, the one I mentioned yes. a minute ago, yep. aren't you? Yeah. And did you say you, you also, in, did you in, in, in interview Dennis McKenna? Yes. Yep. Yeah. We just posted that yeah. one. So um, I did that cool. because of his, his book. So he just released the ESPD mm. 50. So um, right, that's why we right. did that one. So are, are what are some ways that people can get in contact contact with you uh get your book um is there 
good contacts yeah. for you? Sure. Thanks for asking that question. Um, uh, we'll have a website that I don't pay a lot of attention to, but there is some decent material on it, not too much new stuff. Uh, and that's uh, cannabisandspirituality.com. Um, I try to sh either post or share things a lot on the Facebook group, uh, also easy to remember, Cannabis and Spirituality. Uh, the conference uh, also has a Facebook group uh, called Spirit Plant Medicine. Um, and uh, excuse me, um, there's contact information on uh, on my website. And actually, I don't mind saying if somebody's sincere, you know, if you have nasty things to say, uh, <laughs> for, forget it. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, there's a guy, there, uh, there's a wonderful um, writer on some of similar, vaguely similar subjects uh, called Stephen Herod Buner. And um, at the end of his book called Plant Intelligence in the Imaginal Realm, he said something like, uh, uh, you could email me at this address, but if you have something nasty to say, write me at uh, <laughs> Stephen, Stephen doesn't care dot com. Um, <laughs> so um, so uh, if you have something nasty to, to, to say, it says Stephen doesn't give a damn dot com. Okay. Um, but but uh, if you have something useful to, to you know helpful or if you want to ask me a, 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 a question or something uh, you could write me at Stephen Gray medicine at gmail.com it's s t e p h e n uh, g r a y medicine at gmail.com right. um, yeah oh and the book uh, it's called cannabis and spirituality an explorer's guide to an ancient plant spirit ally um, staring well, viewers in the face for a second there <laughs> Uh, it's published by Inner Traditions Park Street Press, and it can be ordered directly from them. It's on Amazon. Uh, and my favorite thing to uh, ask people to do is to go and ask your local independent bookstore uh, to order it for you, uh, because it's very difficult for uh, especially small bookstores, but any bricks and mortar bookstore to survive these days. Um, so the more we can support them, the better, in my opinion. Um, so yeah. Well, great, man. Well, thanks so much for taking the time out of your day to spend it with me and, uh, the listeners and viewers and, um, looking forward to meeting you in the near future at the, at the conference. Well, thanks a lot. And thanks you very much. Thank you very much for your interest in this stuff, Lee. And, uh, you know, you're doing good work by interviewing people that are, they're working in this field. As I say, I, I feel really passionately, you know, really honestly, right from the heart that this is so central to what humanity needs right now is to wake up and anything we can do to help people wake up by sharing information, I think is, is worth doing in this life, you know? And also just want to say uh, in a more personal way that uh, I'm, 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 I've been able to see your face all the way through this. And uh, you've, you've laughed and smiled a lot, which has helped me uh, be cheerful through it as well. Oh, so good, thank man. you for that. I try to yeah. try to be happy. So This episode of Cosmic Echo was brought to you by Inner Traditions. If you enjoyed this episode of Cosmic Echo and would like to learn more about Stephen Gray and his work, you can visit our website at taileaters.com backslash CE podcast. And there you can click on links that would take you to his books as well as his additional work. Additionally, you can support this podcast by clicking on our donation page located at the same website. We look forward to bringing you additional episodes in the near future, but until then, happy dreaming.